Hello everyone, I'm Leif Stevens with Noble Cider. Hopefully you can see and hear me. Um, this is the first time I've done the streaming on YouTube, so the technology, hopefully everything is working right. If you can see me, uh, maybe type something so uh, I know things are working. Um, and we'll give, we'll give a few minutes for people to join. Oh, good. Someone says they can see me. So that's a good sign. Um, there's a quite a long delay, at least on my a preview, between when I talk and when I see things. So I don't know how long that delay is between when I see texts. Uh, so if it looks like I'm not answering your text right away, it could just be that delay. <laughs> All right, well, oh, good. Oh, good. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hopefully, some more people will join in. I'm also going to um, post this video online, so uh, if you didn't catch it, you can watch it later. Um, so again, I'm Leif Stevens with Noble Cider. I'm the cider maker at Noble Cider, and I just want to thank you all so much for joining uh, this live stream and also for being part of the Cider and Mead Club. Um, it's it's a, a really fun thing for me as a cider maker to have the club and be able to make kind of specialty stuff um, and hopefully you're enjoying it out there on your end. Um, we're going to be going through uh, I think five ciders and two meads. Um, different people got kind of different things depending on what part of the club you're in but uh, feel free to follow along. Um, feel free to open the ciders as we talk about them uh, or open them in any order you like. Uh, there's no rules here. So just uh, enjoy yourself. Um, and um, I'm gonna kind of talk about each one, talk a little bit about how each one is made and um, hopefully you'll enjoy that. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is our Lewis Creek uh, batch one. So that's kind of a special cider for us. Uh, about uh, four or five years ago, uh, we formed a partnership with Lewis Creek Farms. And feel free to open this while I'm talking. I'm going to open mine, actually. Pour a little. Uh, we formed a partnership with Lewis Creek Farms, which is one of the larger orchards in our area. And we had actually a, a large press line at our facility, but as we grew, we, we ran out of space. So we formed this partnership and moved our press line out to their farm. And they built a purpose-built building and uh, they juiced their apples on our press line and we formed a juicing company together. So they bring the juice to us uh, a couple times a week. And uh, that's what we use for the majority of our ciders. And one of the really cool things about the, the collaboration with them is because they're apple farmers, uh, we bought and planted, I think it started off at, with about 16 varieties of specialty cider varietals um, that they planted in their orchard. And it, if you don't know, uh, so basically in the commercial apple industry, there are really only about 20 or so varieties that are grown. Um, and those are the ones you see in grocery stores, the culinary and dessert apples like uh, Red Delicious, Yellow Delicious, Gala, Fuji's, Macintosh, um, all those kind of things, Granny Smith. And that's what primarily what farmers are growing. And that's what people who make cider in the United States mostly make cider from. But historically, there are all these great cider varietals that are grown in England and France and places that have had a long cider culture. Um, so we've started growing those with Lewis Creek Farms, and uh, we planted our first apples about four, four or five years ago. And each year we kind of graft 
uh, more apples. Um, actually, I'm going to play a little video. Hopefully this will work. Um, about grafting that I did. And I'll just talk while it's, it's playing uh, in the background here. Let's see if I can do that. There we go. Let's see, skip a bit. This is a video I made about grafting. Um, uh, so they're, one of the great things is that they're great farmers. I don't really know a whole lot about growing apples. Uh, so co uh, forming this collaboration with them was great because they're, you know, they've been growing apples for many, many generations, really know what they're doing. So we bought all these really great apple varieties, British, French, uh, American, old American apples. And the way you buy them is, is what you see here is uh, you buy them as budwood or scions, which is basically just the, uh, a little branch from the apple tree. And that's how you propagate uh, apples. If you take a seed and plant it, you actually end up with a completely new variety of apple. So if you want to grow a Granny Smith, you have to take a cutting from a Granny Smith tree and graft it onto a rootstock. So when you buy apples, you actually just get this this bit of a branch and you graft that onto a rootstock, which is what they're doing here. And, um, and then you plant that. And as that grows, you can take cuttings from that plant and graft it onto additional rootstock. So every year we're taking cuttings from these original trees we bought and adding on. So I think this year they planted about three or four acres of new, new varieties. So they're fairly new trees. Um, you start to get apples after about four or five years. Um, so we're four or five years in right now. So this year, we basically got our first small crop of all these specialty apples. And um, they actually brought a, a small amount of each one to me, which I fermented in very small little containers, uh, just to see what each one kind of tasted like individually. And that was really eye-opening and amazing. So it's, I'm really excited about some of these apples. And part of the club will be releasing some of these as uh, single varietals down the road. Um, but Lewis Creek Batch 1 is basically the small amount of all the apples that we got this year blended with some of the regular apples that we use, the regular um, uh, dessert apples and stuff. And But you definitely get a little bit of characteristics of some of those apples. You get a little bit more tannin. Um, a lot of the British and French uh, cider varietals are very, very high in tannins and bitters. In fact, they're classified often in uh, two categories, bitter sharp and bitter sweet. Um, and the bitter sweets tend to have a, a fair amount of sugar, but not a lot of uh, acid. And the bitter sharps tend to have a bit more acid. So, uh, but this is a mix of all sorts of different apples. There's crab apples in there, there's French apples, there's British apples, um, and not huge quantities of any of them. So this was kind of our fir very first batch of cider that had these new apples in it. Though. So it's really exciting for us. Um, you know, it's still very clean, but you definitely get, you definitely get some of those, those tones um, and, you know, having fermented each of those apples separately, I, I can pick out little bits from different ones. So anyway, a very exciting uh, collaboration and really, really looking forward to future apples that come from that orchard um, and future uh, ciders made from those specialty apples. There's a, a few in particular that are just outstanding that I'm really, really hoping we get next year that we get a good enough that I can make. Uh, some small batches to send to the, to the club. Uh, there's, um, anyway, uh, there are some really, really cool ones. So I'm very, very excited about that. Um, so I'm going to switch back to me here. So this is a, a bin of, of after the, after you've taped them together and the, the budwood grows to the rootstock. It's, it's pretty incredible, really. Um, it's amazing to go out there now and see the various stages of, you know, those first trees that we planted are starting to look like real apple trees now. And then the, the you know, the new ones are in the ground. They just went in like three weeks ago. Uh, this is this is what they look like right when they go in. So that's that's actually the after one year of growth. That's what you're seeing right there. Um, so really exciting. So again, there's a bit of delay. I noticed with this video thing between what I uh, what I'm seeing and uh, I think what you're seeing. So um, anyway, this is a really exciting one for me. 
Um, I'm going to drink it so I can open the next one. I should probably pour a small amount. It's a good one. Um, and, you know, cider is, is it's a wine. It's apple wine. So a lot of these ciders actually get a little bit better over time. Um, I think this one is actually improving over time. It's, it's very nice. So uh, the next one we have is our strawberry cranberry cider. Strawberry raz cranberry cider. So this is a, a great example of sort of the American cider movement. Um, as I mentioned, you know, in the United States, we're all kind of using the same culinary apples, all the cider makers in the United States. And there's nothing wrong with these apples. They're great apples. And having our own juice company is really nice because we can customize our blends a little bit more than a lot of people can. And that's really nice so we can get, you know, the right amount of sugars that we want, the right amount of uh, acid, all those kind of things. But, uh, you know, these, these, these kind of apples, culinary and dessert apples, tend to make cider that's very crisp, very clean. Um, and th that actually fits very much what I find as the American palate. And a lot of these ciders are described as sort of modern or American. Um, that's the style, like when you enter into a contest or something like that. They're in the modern cider category. Um, and a lot of American cider makers are, are really taking that as a, a canvas and doing some really, really unique things, um, adding different fruits. Uh, you know, American cider makers have gotten really creative, you know, adding all sorts of spices. And um, th these are things that in sort of, you know, British and French cider world would be very frowned on and very purist. So the American market's kind of a little different um and this de that definitely fits into the modern category this is um fermented with strawberry juice raspberry juice and cranberry juice and then i blended in some strawberry raspberry and cranberry juice at the end for the sweetness so all the sweetness comes from the juice uh there's no sugar added or anything like that um we like to try to stay very kind of pure with our ciders and not add a whole lot uh other than the the base things that are in them so uh, this was a really, really popular release. Um, usually with small batch releases, I put them out and, um, you know, I just make basically one batch. But this one just sold out immediately, so I had to make a, a second round of it uh, to fill all our orders. Um, so very popular. Um, you can see it's a, a nice red color. Very, very nice. Uh, rosé-ish color. And it's really nice. It's, um, you know, we, we do a lot of kind of drier ciders. Um, not super dry. I like to, I like to try to make cider, uh, balanced. Um, so I like to add the right amount of sweetness to fit, um, the profile of the apple. So in this case, it's kind of, um, you know, with the cranberry, you, you've got all that tartness, so you need a little bit of sweetness to kind of balance that out, I feel like. Um, sometimes when you have apples that are really, really tart and you make it really, really dry, that can be a, a little hard to drink. Um, so you, you do have to use that sweetness to kind of balance uh, the characteristic of the apple. And that's how I like to approach sweetness. Uh, I don't like to make things just super sweet just because. Because my own palate is uh, definitely on the drier side. So that's kind of what I go for with ciders. Um, I, I like this very much. <laughs> It's uh, it's uh, nice and tart, which I think is a nice quality in sort of the modern ciders. Nice carbonation. So that's the um, strawberry cranberry raspberry. Um, and we we recently switched to cans from bottles, um, which has been a great move in terms of the industry. People really, really like cans and we're, we're selling way more cans than we did bottles. Um, so it's a, it's a great move. I, I really kind of like bottles. I like cans now too. I've, I've actually kind of changed my mind and I, I like them a lot more than I used to. And the technology for cans has really changed the linings and everything. They're much, much better than they used to be. Um, so uh, right in the middle of sort of 
Um, I'll go through and answer some questions uh, shortly. But um, right in the middle of the, you know, this has been such a crazy time. We bought a canning line right sort of March. It showed up right in March. I mean, we ordered it, you know, months and months and months before that, six months before that. Uh, so in the middle of March, uh, we get a canning line, which is sort of, right when everything was happening. And uh, so it was definitely a crazy time to be switching to cans. And it was also this year a huge can shortage. So <laughs> it's been an interesting time. Um, and that's part of the reason that these all these batches are in 16 ounces is that's what the cans we had. So um, yeah, that's a great cider. I really enjoy that one. Um, Yeah, we got a question about like what are the, some future uh, small batch flavors. Um, we, you know, I'm I'm getting more organized in terms of uh, figuring out those flavors pretty far in advance now. So there there is actually um, a, a sort of a timeline of flavors, and uh, I, I'm happy to send that to anyone who's who's interested. Um, you know, as as we grow, distribute our distributors want to kind of know what we're doing pretty far in advance. So um, we we have um, kind of a small batch program that a lot of that goes to Cider Club and then a, it's, a lot of it goes into ke into kegs and out to accounts. Um, and then we make some stuff that's really, really like micro batch. And that pretty much just goes to a little bit to our tap rooms and, and to the club. So uh, it's kind of two different things there. Um, the next cider that we're going to look at is the Blue Bard. And this is um, perhaps my favorite cider. Um, it was, I think, the third cider that we ever released. Um, and it's it's now one of our seasonals. It's our spring seasonal. But I think it's the, the one, it's one of our oldest ciders. It was before we had really seasonals. We just released it. And then it became one of our seasonals later. Um, and it's it's quite a process to make. We Every year we get, now we're making pretty good quantities of it. So we buy several thousand pounds of blueberries, uh, main blueberries. And they arrive frozen, um, which is how we want them. Um, because blueberries, you can't really juice a blue, blueberry when it's fresh. You have to freeze it, which the freezing breaks down the cell walls. And then when you thaw it, you compress it and you get juice. Um, so it's actually really important that they're frozen first. Um, timing it is, is really interesting because they come, we buy them in these massive totes. And so I have to kind of time it so that they thaw by the time we press them. But I also don't want them to, you know, rot or anything. So it's kind of a, an interesting timing. It takes about two, three weeks to thaw one of these totes. Um, and some years we've pressed very frozen uh blueberries and originally i built this little press um that we pressed all of our apples on um now we have this massive press that we have with lewis creek farms um but we still use the little press for small kind of small pressings of fruit so with the blueberries we take those blueberries and we press them on that little press uh so it, we everyone at the cidery kind of pitches in it's an all-day affair uh, we press about um, three, four hundred liters of juice, and we take all that juice, most of that juice, and freeze it. Um, and then we take all the blueberries that we pressed and we throw those into the fermenter. So, uh, the blueberry itself, you know, the skin has a, a decent amount of tannin and a lot of color. So, I like to ferment with those because that you get a little bit of the blueberry flavor, but you also get a nice, nice little hint of tannin and a uh, nice kind of purplish color. And so we ferment with the blueberries in the tank. And then we have to get the blueberries out after fermentation is done. That's quite a, um, an undertaking. Um, this year I hauled several thousand pounds of blueberries into my compost. At home. <laughs> um, so we ferment. And then at the end, we blend in that blueberry ju juice that we froze. And we, I have this huge kettle. And we heat that blueberry juice up in the kettle and add honey and rosemary to that. And huge quantities of rosemary, um, like 10, 15 pounds of rosemary, which is a lot of rosemary. And 
Uh, we basically kind of brew that like a tea, and then that gets blended back into the base cider, and you end up with this really kind of nice. Um, I just I just love this cider. It's you got that those tones of the you know it's real blueberry, it's real juice. Um, the blueberry really comes through. I think the rosemary gives it this kind of a little bit savory kind of thing. Um, in fact, it's it's one of my it, it is my favorite cider for cooking with. Um, I cook all sorts of things using blue bard. I, I definitely have a bunch of cans at home that I'll use for, you know, stir frying vegetables or, you know, a lot, uh, there were actually a number of restaurants in this area that were using it to cook meat with. And um, anyway, really love it. In fact, my favorite drink, I think probably my favorite drink is um, a snake bite made with blue bard, which a snake bite is, if you don't know, um, it's usually like a uh, Irish stout of some sort. Uh, Guinness, Murphy's are the most common. That's on nitro. And then you pour that and generally pour cider on the top or bottom of that. And they se separate. Um, so doing one of those with blue bard, amazing. If you're ever in the Asheville area, come to the tap room and get one of those because they're amazing. Um, so definitely one of my favorite ciders. You know, and these ones that we make every year, especially these ones that are, you know we're pressing a lot of fruit, they do vary quite a bit from year to year, depending on you know the the, the berries themselves are a little different every year, um, and you know each batch is a little bit different, which is I think a really nice thing in these small batches. So um, I think it turned out really good this year. Every year I, I've noticed something with the blue bard is that it almost has a sort of vanilla-ish flavor which I think is just the honey reacting with the rosemary, and it's kind of, there is no vanilla added, but I, I get that every year, and it's this kind of nice, smooth um, flavor. Um, I used to, in the early years, actually let the blue bard go into uh, something called a malolactic fermentation, which is uh, a fermentation where um, the malic acid, which is the natural acid in cider, gets converted to malic acid, um, or lactic acid, sorry, which is an acid that is uh, less, we perceive it as being less acidic. So it, some of the acidity kind of gets removed in that process. You also generate some really interesting kind of flavors if it's done right. Um, it's something that they do in certain wines too, to, to get certain flavors. Chardonnays, for instance, go through that. Um, so that's the Blue Bard. Um, next up, we have our pineapple jalapeno cider um this is uh we have um someone who works for us jonathan who uh, he he was on me he's been on me for years to make a pineapple jalapeno cider and um i finally did it uh a year or so ago and it turned out really nice um to make this one we take pineapple juice um actually in this case it, it's almost like a, it's a real thick pineapple juice. It's almost like a puree. Uh, cl it's, cl it's a cloudy pineapple juice. Much cloudier than you'd get, like if you bought pineapple juice at a store. Um, and we add that to the tank with the apple juice, and we cut up um, jalapeno and serrano peppers. And we just chop them up and put them in kind of seeping bags and put those in the tank uh, at the beginning of the fermentation. And those stay in throughout fermentation. And with, with we, we do a number of kind of ciders that have some spice to them, some heat. Um, but I generally try to make them not too spicy because I want them to be drinkable. I don't want people to drink them and just not be able to, you know, drink very, very much of them. So I try to keep them pretty balanced and not too much heat. So this one, it you get the pepper and you get... Um, the flavor of the pepper and a little bit of the heat from the pepper, but it's not a super intense experience. Um, sometimes when when we mention uh, like a, a pepper cider uh, and we have both the pineapple jalapeno and the spicy spicy tart in this selection, uh, people get a little bit scared about the heat. But uh, I try to keep them quite uh, drinkable, and uh, hopefully. Hopefully that's your experience too. Um, I, I do want to make a, a, an intensely hot one at some point, but you know, there's a limited market for that and that's not for everyone. And I kind of wanted these ciders to be ciders that, uh, you know, people 
anyone can enjoy, even if you're not wanting a cider that's super hot. So when I first take a, a, a sip of these, this one in particular, it's definitely, you, you get that on the nose. You get the heat on the nose, the, the pepper. Um, it almost makes me want to cough or sneeze if you inhale it. Um, but when you drink it, uh, you know, so the pepper is definitely there on the nose. But when you drink it, it there's not a lot of heat, really. But uh, you do get the kind of the flavor of the pepper, but not in like an unpleasant way, which is something I was actually really worried about with these. Uh, I experimented a bunch when I was making this with, you know, um, kind of juicing the pepper first or, you know, adding the pepper afterwards or, or you know, kind of what worked. And um, the way we're doing it, where we kind of chop them up and put them in the fermenter was the best in terms of getting a nice pepper flavor, but not like a like a green pepper flavor. I didn't want that to be like an overwhelming flavor of the cider. Um, so I think I feel like it's really nice and balanced. It's um, it, it makes me want pizza for some reason. This one. <laughs> ah, it's good. Um, reading some of these comments. Yeah, yeah um, someone asking about doing a, uh, Victoria asking about doing a contest. Um, an employee cider creation competition. Uh, you know, yeah, that would be a great thing to do. Um, our employees come up with some great ideas and um in you know i'm i'm the head cider maker but we have several other production people and they're always coming up with really creative ideas and um in fact one of our production guys has some really out there ideas and he's doing some pretty interesting fermentation so um I'm really kind of excited about what some of the stuff he's coming up with. Um, they're kind of even beyond things I've ever thought about doing. Um, and kind of excited about some of those. Uh, question about yeasts that we use. Do we use uh, natural yeasts? Um, we, in the early days, I used a lot, a lot of different yeasts. Um, but over time, I kind of found a few yeasts that I really, really liked the profile of. And, you know, in yeast is one of these things that if, if you use it in a facility, it kind of gets everywhere in the air. Um, and it's really kind of best to stay with some specific yeasts, um, although we still do use a number of different yeasts. Um, it, it really just depends on the cider. There's a few of the small batch ones where I, I really kind of have always used particular yeasts that I, I have liked for those, like the like the Blue Bard, for instance, um, there were particular yeasts that I, I did, I did, I used to do when I do a small batch, I do 20, 30 trials of different yeasts to kind of see what, which yeast worked best with those, those flavors. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years or so now, and I've done a lot of cider batches. So I kind of have an idea of, of the profile of different yeasts and so now I can when I have an idea of what I want to make I'm much better at kind of picking the yeast for that um, and we, we generally use commercial yeasts so we'll use um, mostly white wine yeasts sometimes champagne yeast sometimes beer yeasts um, they're all kind of similar in, in a way uh, there's there's some really out there yeasts like when you get into sort of brett and um, or, or into wild fermentations, which we do some of. If uh, last, I think in the last cider batch we had the um, the cedra, and that was uh, a cider that was done much more in a sort of a Spanish style. So Spanish ciders, they actually just put the juice into generally chestnut um, wood tanks, and those tanks are you know full of uh, all sorts of um, natural yeast and bacterias and they let that just ferment and that's spanish cider spanish cider tends to have a kind of a little bit of a, a vinegary kind of profile um and I, th I think with that that particular cedra we kind of really captured that we actually got a, bought a whole bunch of 
pretty much every Spanish cider we could find in the area and uh, tried them side by side with that. And it really kind of, it, it was, if anything, kind of a clean version of, of a lot of those. Uh, so I do love to play around with yeasts. Uh, <laughs> Someone say the pineapple's their husband's favorite. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, the Earl Grey is definitely one of my favorites too. Um, someone saying that the Earl Grey is one of their favorites. Uh, tea is is awesome for making cider because uh, traditional like French and British ciders they do use apples that have a lot of tannin. And as I said, a lot of the apples that we have access to do not have a lot of tannin. So tea is kind of a, a, a neat way to add tannin back in. And it's actually something some winemakers will do is make a real strong batch of uh, cider with tea in it and blend that in to get the kind of the right tannin profile. Um, so uh, yeah, I really like the Earl Grey. We'll probably do that again, uh, another batch of that sooner than later. Um, all right, so the next cider that we have is is the spicy tart um so this was kind of um a takeoff on our village tart which is by far our most popular cider village tart was the second cider that we ever made the first being standard bearer and standard bearer was the only cider we made for the first year and a half um and it wasn't called standard bearer it was just called noble cider uh, and then when we introduced Village Tart, we had to come up with a name <laughs> for Standard and for Village Tart. And there's still some places that have had us on tap for eight, nine years that just still call it Noble Cider. Uh, so Spicy Tart, um, we, we had some of our, our staff, some of our tap room people actually suggesting, hey, why don't we do like a bunch of different versions of Village Tart? Um, and so this was kind of taking that idea and... Um, for this one, it's actually fairly different the way I make it. The, a village tart, we basically ferment our cider and then we blend in uh, a, a uh, kind of a tart cherry, Montmorency. It's, it's a blend of cherries, but it's, um, it's, it's basically tart cherry juice that we blend in and that gives it that nice cherry kind of profile. For this one, we take uh, cherry juice and uh, again... Um, serrano peppers and ancho peppers which are uh, dried plebanos um, and we add all that into the fermenter so it's actually fermented with the cherry which gives it a really different flavor uh, taking fruit and using it like after fermentation um, versus putting it in the fermentation really gives you different profiles and so for different fruits um, I will often do trials and see kind of what I like, but uh, some, some fruits seem to lend themselves better to being fermented. Some lend themselves better to being kind of added afterwards. If you want like a nice kind of fruity profile, you add it afterwards. If you want more of a wine-like expression of the fruit, um, you add it during fermentation. Um, you know, if you, you think of grape juice versus wine, uh, they're, they're, they're really rather different. Um, grape juice is this fruity grape thing and wine almost is you know it's it's hard to tell it's even grape in, in a way um so you know if you take a fruit and you ferment it you get something very very different from the flavor of that fruit um and so with the cherries what i find is when we add that into the juice and ferment it um we get a much darker richer flavor and the uh peppers give it a little bit of spice and the ancho peppers in particular uh being this dried pepper uh, give it this nice kind of um, earthy kind of tone. Um, I really, really like this one. It's very, very different from the Village Tart, I think. Um, and when I the first batch I made of this, I just, I just, it, it was kind of my favorite for quite a while, and I, I still like it quite a lot. But <laughs> we do a lot of great ciders, so it's hard to say favorite anymore. Um, but um, I definitely get the peppers, but again, it's not overwhelmingly spicy. Um, I just love the, the characteristics of this one. Um, very kind of smoky almost. Um, 
very rich, uh, a little bit earthy, but like in a good way. And um, you get the cherry, but the cherry is not, it's not like, wow, this is cherry. It's, it's a nice kind of subdued, rich kind of cherry flavor. Um, it was a fun cider. <laughs> Uh, some some comments about um, worrying that the blue bar would be too sweet. Um, yeah, you know, we, I really try not to do too, too sweet. As I say, I try to do balanced. Um, I, I'm not afraid of doing sweet things, but to me, they have to still be kind of balanced. Um, certain fruits lend themselves to being sweeter, uh, certain kind of combinations. Uh, but, oh. Overall, I like my personal palate is, is definitely on the drier side. I want things to be in the, more in the kind of the wine world a little bit um, rather than, uh, I don't know, a lot of this, you know, when we started Noble Cider, there were not very many ciders on the market. And what was on the market was really, really sweet generally, um, almost soda-like. And so that was a big... Uh, conscious effort when we started it was like let's make ciders that are really showcase the apple and aren't just like a soda um so that's kind of how i approach the ciders uh you know i i i fully realize that there are people who have uh, a sweet tooth and like things sweeter and and that's fine we do make uh, a few ciders that are sweeter but my personal palate is for them to be a little drier so that's t what i tend to make <laughs> Um, so that's the spicy tart and, um, yeah, if anyone has any questions about any of these ciders, uh, please ask them. Um, I'm going to go into the meads next, which, uh, you know, the way our clubs are structured, there's, um, there's sort of a cider version and there's a mead, uh, version that has cider and mead. So not everyone got the meads, but if you did get the meads, uh, feel free to stick around and s I'm going to be tasting those. If you didn't get the meads, uh, you know, stick around anyway. <laughs> um, mead is, um, it's kind of, I guess, a newer thing for us, although we've made it for quite some time just in the tap room. I've, uh, I think I started making mead about six years ago uh, just to have kind of in the tap rooms, I would make uh, pretty small amounts and we just have it on tap. And we've, we've, we've had a mead tap at our main tap room for quite a long time. Um, and then I guess maybe two, three years ago, we started making it commercially uh, and actually distributing it. Um, and we make, we make a, a, a few different full strength meads and then we make our uh, session meads which those have been very popular because the session meads are kind of, I don't know, they're kind of a gateway into mead if, you're, if you haven't really experienced mead. Um, they're very, very approachable. Uh, they're, you know, being a session mead, they're lower gravity. I think they're, they're both five ABV, the two that we have. But we also do full strength meads and meads are very, in some ways, very different from cider. Um, you know, a, a batch of cider can take anywhere from four to six weeks, something like that. Sometimes they take a lot longer, depending on what we're doing. I mean, there's there's definitely ciders that we have that have taken, you know, six months to make. But in general, they're mostly kind of made in sort of a really a three to eight week window, let's say. But most of them are sort of in that sort of four, four week time period. That's kind of how long it takes apple juice generally to ferment, um, unless you're doing some kind of aging process at the end. But with mead, uh, it really takes a lot longer to make. Um, with a full strength mead like this one, the saw, this is the saw palmetto. Um, this one, I think I originally fermented it two years ago. So, um, and it's been aging since then. Uh, so there's a, there's, it takes a lot longer for mead to kind of reach its optimal kind of flavor. Um, some of them are younger, but just the fermentation process itself often takes two, three months, um, and then aging after that. Um, so this is a 
what would be called, I guess, like a show mead or just a, it's just a straight mead, really, um, which is to say it's just honey and water. Um, it's in this case, it's salt palmetto honey. And when I say that, it's it's um, honey that bees harvested mostly from the uh, blossoms of salt palmetto. Um, so uh, people who are making honey will put their hives near the whatever plant they want that um, that honey to be um, while that that plant is blossoming and so the bulk of that the nectar that the bees collect will be from those particular flowers and then they can call it salpimento in this case um, there's there's always some of other blossoms mixed in but um, you really it's really amazing tasting different honeys and the amount of uh, different flavors you can get from just honey. And that translates in mead. Um, we just did a fermentation, and you'll probably get these in the next uh, Cider and Mead Club, of uh, a, um, a honey that's a mulatto honey, they call it. It's from Brazil, and it's a tree honey, uh, which is to say um, it, that the actual nectar is collected from aphids that create this, that basically eat sap and secrete um, sugar, which the bees collect and turn into honey. And uh, it has this really robust, rich flavor. And then the other one we fermented at the same time is a mesquite blossom honey, which is this very, very light, mild flavored honey. And you couldn't get more different. Like literally, when you're looking at the honey, the mesquite honey is almost white in color, and the um, the mulatto honey was is almost black in color. Um, just, and those are just two different honeys. And so we're fermenting those with water. So with this one, uh, it's just honey and water. Sal pimento has got a really unique flavor, and um, yeah, really like this one. We didn't do a huge amount of this one. Um, we've had it on tap and the cider club, cider and mead club, and that's pretty much it for this one. Um, it's um, 12 ABV. Um, the sweetness that's in it is just the residual honey, nothing else added. It's, as I say, it's just honey, water, and yeast. It's literally the ingredients. Um, and... Uh, just a really nice kind of robust it, it's really interesting because you know I tasted this honey before we fermented it and a lot of those characteristics that we got from that honey they're still there you know they're really it's just kind of amazing how how much of those subtleties come through in a mead um, a lot of mead is made from, um, particularly commercial mead, is made from um, wildflower honey. And there's nothing wrong with wildflower honey, but wildflower honey tends to be uh, one of two things. It's, it's either honey that the bees have collected from lots and lots of sources, and so it's wildflower honey, they call it, because it's a mix of so many different things, or... Uh, quite often it's just lots and lots of different honeys that the company selling the honey have mixed together, blended together. Um, some, some companies call this polyfloral honey instead, which I think is a little bit more accurate. Um, so th there's definitely some weird stuff that goes on in the honey market out there. Um, as, as a mead maker, you, you have to be really kind of careful about where you buy honey and that it's actually honey too, because, um, some places will cut honey with various things, and that's no good. Um, for mead, you want uh, as raw honey as possible. Uh, you don't want it to have been heated very much, uh, pasteurized. Uh, it's pretty common to heat honey pretty hot to, uh, to bottle it and to put it in jars and things. Um, so we don't want that. We want as raw honey as we can get. Um, so this is a really nice one that we've had setting aside for a while, salt palmetto. Um, I'll definitely try to get some more salt pimento down the road. 
and um, yeah nice color this one was uh, no filtering or anything um, it takes a long time for meads to get pretty clear on their own uh, years often um, we have a crossflow filter being a commercial cidery uh, which is an amazing device it's it's a it's a great filtration and um, you know for some meads it can be really really a nice thing to clarify them and uh, cleans up the the flavor um, there are different methods of filtration out there. I, I've found that the crossflow filter that we have um, does a, a really nice filtration in terms of cleaning uh, the cider or mead up, but without stripping flavor out. Um, just very, very impressed overall with the, the, what goes through that. Um, so this one, this one wasn't filtered, but sometimes we do filter meads uh, if we don't want to age them for two or three years. Um, so uh, I'm gonna grab another mead that's over here. This is the other mead we sent out, which was a kiwi hibiscus lemon mead. Um, and it, uh, has gone through an in-bottle fermentation. Uh, so it is a, it is a bit carbonated, um, very carbonated, which is why I had it sitting outside. I opened these and it, it was pretty foamy when it came out. Um, nice tight bubbles though. Uh, really nice flavor. Um, kiwi is kind of a new thing we're experimenting with. Um, it's a really interesting flavor. We're working actually on some um, kiwi ciders that we're, we're doing. Uh, you know, kiwi has this nice, sharp flavor. It's kind of subtle. Um, but so this has got kiwi in it. It's got hibiscus flowers. Uh, we basically make a tea of hibiscus. And the lemon is a uh, lemon peel. So um, with uh, fruits, we can use, um, like, we can put lemon in. Uh, which gives it a very acidic flavor. Uh, I find that using peels of citrus is a really nice thing. It's how we do our, our spritzers, for instance. We make a tea with, you know, uh, a botanical and a peel. And the peels are nice because they give it a, a nice amount of sort of a bitter. Um, and, it, you know, it's a different, it's definitely a different flavor than the fruit itself. And, um, so for this, I kind of wanted that, that kind of that bitter from that. Um, so definitely carbonated, nice bubbles. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, Victoria. She says her bottle when she opened it, it exploded all over her kitchen, and the cork actually. Popped out on its own. Took her a while to find. Um, very sorry, Victoria. Um, yeah, mine, when I popped it open, was a bit more carbonated than I was expecting. Um, it's kind of what happens with in-bottle carbonation somewhat. Um, you know, that's kind of uh, how champagne is done. Champagne is an in-bottle carbonation uh, or sparkling wine. It doesn't come from the champagne region. Um and yeah, you, you get a very, very different sort of carbonation when you do an in-bottle um, uh, um, carbonation versus forced carbonation. So like with these ciders, um, we put the cider into a, a bright tank. So it's very much like a process like making beer. We put it into a bright tank, which is a vessel that's designed to hold a lot of pressure. And uh, they have these special stones in them where we can push CO2 into, we chill the cider way down and then uh, uh, the, st the carbonation stones release kind of a carpet of very, very fine bubbles into the cider. Um, and that's how we carbonate most of our ciders. Um, however, if you do bottle conditioning like, like this one, then you can get 
the type of carbonation you get is very different. You get these very, very fine bubbles, very, very tight bubbles, uh, small bubbles. It feels very different in your mouth uh, than, you know, like a cider or a beer, which, which has a little bit of different kind of feel, the carbonation. So um, I like in bottle carbonation. It's a little bit tricky to uh, get exactly right. Um, these are champagne bottles that they're in, so they're designed to hold a lot of pressure. Um, but yeah, sorry if that uh, popped out. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, lots of bottles exploding. Um, so hopefully the bottle itself didn't explode. Um, but uh, so, sorry, I wasn't intending for it to be quite that carbonated. Um, but the flavor is very, very nice. And um, most of our ciders go through, um, we, so with, with cider, if it's sweet, and most of ours are sweet, you know, to, to a degree, um, some of them are very, very dry, but they all have a little bit of sweetness, generally. Um, you have to stabilize them in some way. Uh, so, you know, you're putting a sweet product into a can, and it's going to, recarbonate in the can referment and in a can that's a really bad thing because the can will explode uh, it can't hold that amount of pressure so um all cider basically unless it's completely dry has to be um stabilized in some way and we we stabilize by we actually after we fill the, the cans we put them in these bins big bins three of them and then they get stacked and they get with our forklift, we load it, lower them into this huge hot water bath, and we pasteurize them, basically. Um, we do a very low level of pastor pasteurization. It doesn't really affect the flavor, but it means that um, the, the product that is in the can is stable and is not going to re-ferment. Um, and we've had great luck with that. We've had very few problems. Um, and that's a... I like doing it that way. The alternative ways of stabilizing are... Uh, through sterile filtration, which is inherently problematic um, because you can you can sterile filter something, but then you're putting it into a vessel that may or may not be entirely sterile. Um, or the most common way with cider is chemical stabilization. So many, many, many ciders out there have potassium sorbate in them, which is uh, for stabilizing. Um, or uh, there's a pro product called Vulcrin, Vulcrin, which is a gas that's injected. And um, Vulcrin doesn't have to be listed, so you don't necessarily know that that's in there. Uh, potassium sorbate does have to be listed, although a lot of people don't. Um, so anyway, <laughs> just as a, uh, a side, aside, that's how we stabilize generally is pasteurization. So... Well, I'm glad I'm glad you were able to drink most of it. <laughs> um, so that's that one. Um, I think uh, the meads. You know, we we're making more and more mead. Um, the last few batches of mead that I've made, not these ones necessarily. These were good, but um, I feel like I'm kind of getting. You know, I've made a lot of cider, a lot of cider <laughs> over the years, and I, I really feel like I have a pretty good handle on cider. Mead is a newer thing to me, and um, I've made quite a lot of that too, but every time I make a new batch of mead, and again, it's it's a little bit of a different thing because with cider, I'm, I'm literally starting new ciders every week. Um, with meads, it's like I make a mead, and then it sits for three or four months, and then I make another mead. Um, there's a little less of a turnaround there. But with the meads, I, I, I just really feel like the last few meads we've made have been really good. So like with the blueberry mead, which I'm sure you'll get again, and um, I, I know you've gotten it before in the mead club, but you know every batch we make is quite different. Um, in the last batch that we made, I put probably two or three times the amount of blueberries that I, I ha ever have before. And... Um, you know, these are the same blueberries that we're using for the bluebard. Uh, I tend to make the blueberry one at the same time because that, that's when we get blueberries. Um, so I put a huge amount of blueberries in this time. And the result was a really, really wine-like mead. It really drinks 
very, very much like a red wine. Um, we aged it with oak and um, it's definitely the best meat I've made, I think, so far. So that will probably be going out um, and we do have a schedule for meads as well. Uh, just really feel like we're dialing the meads and they're getting better and better. Um, and uh, anyway, really, really, really happy with how the last few meads have turned out. And um, I hope that you've uh, enjoyed all of these ciders and meads. Um, we are going to uh, continue to make really cool things and have a whole schedule of really interesting ciders coming out. Very, very excited about our collaboration with Lewis Creek and um, really, really looking forward to uh, getting to work with those apples and release that to all of you out there. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I really, really appreciate you joining and I really appreciate you being part of the clubs. Um, they're, they're a lot of fun and I really enjoy making the, the specialty stuff that's a little bit different from the production stuff that we make. Um, not that there's anything wrong with the production stuff. It's, it's great, but it's really nice to kind of be able to be a little more creative in making things. So I really, really appreciate all of you joining, uh, tonight and I hope you've enjoyed drinking all of these and, um, I'm going to try to do a video, uh, with each release and, We'll do it live, but it will also be available to watch later uh, as you're drinking these. So um, if you have any questions down the road, let me know. And I really appreciate you watching. So um, thank you so much. Uh, have a good evening. <laughs>